Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in the complex PCI and to my uh, co-chair, Dr. Nan from Korea and all the panelists. Um, we have uh, six cases today on challenging case presentations uh, from five different countries. Um, I'd like to start with the first case, first presentation um, to be delivered by Dr. Hasru Rashid from Monash Heart and Victorian Heart Institute. He's going to talk about an extremely rare case or cause of coronary perforation from optical coherence tomography catheter. Dr. Hasru, please. All right, uh, so thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Rashid from Monash Heart, and today I'd like to highlight a case that highlights a potential complication that may arise from intracoronary imaging and how intracoronary imaging itself can also save the day. I have nothing to disclose. I'd like to present Mr. P, who is a 77-year-old gentleman who presented to our hospital for an elective OCT-guided PCI for stable angina with a previous stent to his RCA, diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia. Uh, he is on dual antiplatelet therapy and was on three antianginal therapy on admission. Imaging of his RCA revealed a patent mid-RCA stent, and his circumflex here you can see ha has minor irregularities, and you can just appreciate a very small ramus that is uh, very important in this case, that ramus has small uh, minor irregularities. But this is the star of the show here. This is the LAD, and you can appreciate that there is moderate um, mild tortuosity in the proximal uh, LED followed by a severe stenosis in the distal uh, LED. So our plan was for an OCT guided PCR with distal LED as he was enrolled in an OCT study and then subsequently to form a, an FFR assessment of the proximal lesions. We had a right radial artery approach and an EBU 3.5 guide. Um, I had delivered a BMW wire but then I had significant difficulties delivering the OCT catheter beyond this proximal LED lesion. Uh, this is the um, OCT catheter after it was externalized. And you can appreciate that every time I extend, I pushed, put a, a bit of minor forward tension, the OCT then kinked in the left main. Uh, and you can appreciate here the kinking when I externalized this OCT catheter. And then when the OCT kinked, the patient reported severe chest pain and I knew something was wrong. So I quickly externalized the OCT catheter and took a quick angiogram. This is what I found. This patient had a severe Ellis type three coronary artery perforation near the distal left main bifurcation. And we hypothesized that the kinked OCT tip potentially had penetrated through the vessel and perforated the, vest, uh, the wall. We then activated a code blue and a called for an urgent echo. I then swiftly delivered a 3.5 uh, millimeter balloon and inflated it at the distal left main to tamponade the perforation. It was only after inflating the balloon, I realized that the perforation was actually close to the origin of the ramus and the circumflex artery, as you can see on the right. Then uh, I wired the circumflex with a Sion blue guide wire and inflated a 2.5 millimeter balloon to seal this perforation. This improved its hemodynamic to 110 millimeters mercury, and this balloon was left inflated for 15 minutes. A bedside echo confirmed a small pericardial fusion that was stable, so we managed to avert a pericardial synthesis as we were quick and swift in our actions. Uh, the patient stabilized, and we had anesthetists in the room, and they elected not to intubate him because he was stable. And we had the cardiothoracic team ready in case he required urgent surgery, but they, they had our, we had their blessing to go ahead and, uh, and attempt a percutaneous approach. After a total of 30 minutes of balloon inflation, there was still, uh, unfortunately, extra visation. So then we delivered a B-graph, a 3 year by 24 millimeter covered stent to the circumflex artery. And as you can see here, we wanted the, uh, left, the stent to slightly land into the left main because we want to make sure that we can definitely seal this perforation. The worst thing would be to miss land the stent and still have active perforation. Uh, so here you can see the balloon inflated uh, and contrast given to show that we were slightly into the left main. We then post dilated the, uh, the out inflow with a 3-5 millimeter balloon. And we can see that we have successfully um, sealed the perforation. But unfortunately, as the saying goes, complications sometimes come in pairs. And unfortunately for Mr. P, this was the case here. Uh, caudal imaging uh, here, as you can see, confirms a type B coronary artery dissection from the ost at the osteoproximal LED. And this was likely due to the initial balloon tamponade with a 3-5 millimeter balloon in the left main. The ACT at this stage was 170 seconds because we wanted it to be slightly lower because of the act uh, active initial perforation. But because this was sealed, we then gave him 4,000 units of heparin to achieve therapeutic ACT. 
At this stage, I then delivered a three five by 12 millimeter design stent. Uh, and then as you can see here, we successfully treated this uh, with this stent. Uh, angiographically, the patient was stable. We managed to avert a major catastrophe. And our plan was to actually do a stage procedure for the remaining LED lesions. He was stable during the admission uh, with a minor tripodin rise uh, and a um, minor pericardial fusion. Uh, and the next few slides highlight how intracoronary imaging saves the day. So our plan here, he returned on day four for IVUS assessment of the second flex stents and then atrophy guided PCI to his LED. Um, we performed IVUS to the left circumflex, which confirmed there were no distal edge complication, uh, good at stent acquisition expansion, and also mild tapering of the inflow from the osteo LED stent that we implanted. I then went ahead to deliver a 225 uh, Zients um, stent and then post it with a 25. And, on, and then on IVUS, I found that this stent was well expanded with no complications, but the earlier stents that we inserted in the previous admission was uh, in the previous case was actually underexpanded. So we post dilated this further with a 4-0 uh, balloon. But as you can see on FFR, we then unmask the lesion in the mid LED uh, with a step up from 0.77 to 0.92. So then using the earlier IVUS images, I delivered a 225 Zion Sierra stent, post dilated this up to 25 and a 375 using the IVUS imaging. And this was uh, the final image that we have here. Um, I wanted to repeat an FFR and also our IVUS, but we had two STEMIs in ED, so unfortunately we couldn't do it. Uh, so I'd like to finalize this case by summarizing that this was uh, an index case of a coronary perforation from a kinked OCT catheter, which is likely the first reported case, treated with a carbon stent, and subsequently an osteoproximal LED dissection from balloon tamponade treated with PCI to os with his osteoproximal LED. In a stage procedure, he had IVUS and FFR got a PCI to his proximal mid distal LED and also assessment of the left circumflex stent. He was fine. He was in hospital for a total of six days. He was discharged on aspirin and tacagalor. Uh, our plan was for at least one year and on recent follow-up, he is stable. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Hasru, for a very interesting challenge. A very interesting and rare dissection or perforation created by your OCT. Um, I like to invite the panelists in to uh, uh, interrogate Dr. Hasru a little bit. We got about three minutes. Can I just invite the first uh, panelist, Dr. Edgar Tay from Singapore, uh, uh, to be involved in, in this case? Please, Dr. Edgar yes, um, Thank you very yeah. much, Hasru. That was an excellent uh, case. Um, demonstrates how sometimes you can you really have to be uh, kind of ready for these uh, complications that occur in the lab. Um, I just want to find out from you, um, what was the um, guide wire that was used for the uh, LED and um, um, is it a kind of like a workhorse guide wire or did you actually try to use a kind of like a stiffer wire to try to get the OCD catheter down or what, what, what was the, you guys, I missed a little bit of the front part. Uh, I think it was okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so initially, I delivered a BMW wire. Um, that was my initial workhorse wire. Uh, I actually subsequently after that, as we, I initially had difficulties delivering the um, the, C, uh, the OCT catheter, I delivered a C on blue uh, as uh, as another body wire as well. Uh, I didn't deliver a BHW, which would, would have probably in retrospect given us a bit more support. I think in retrospect, the issue with the case was I underestimated the mild tortuosity and combined with probably the calcified lesion of the proximal uh, LED that was not really clearly seen on, uh, on imaging, but uh, on, uh, on angiography. But later on, when we IVS it in the second case, it was quite heavily calcified. So that just shows you how useful intracoronary imaging is when you can deliver it. It's also interesting the location of the perforation in terms of uh, how the king actually Perforated the uh, uh, kind of like a branch rather than the main vessel itself. Yeah. So it truly shows you it's probably at the angle where there's the tortuosity was. You push a little bit and it kind of deviated that that sharp edge to the other side. Yeah, I think that's exactly correct, Dr. Tay. Um, and I think this also highlights the fact that the new OCT catheters, uh, which is the Optis catheter, actually has a slightly uh, more rigid. Um, uh, transition point from the monorail and the lens marker. So potentially, uh, and they've actually found that in bench testing, that was the reason why there was a lot of kinking in that area. And I'm sure um, some of you would have some experience with the kinking of the caster, but I guess I didn't fully appreciate the kink until it became too late, which is a very good learning. Great case. Yeah. Great case. I also found that uh, potential kinking problem of the first generation OCT uh, 
a scary uh, thing to have. Uh, sometimes when you take it out, the pushability is gone completely. And uh, I'll give up rather than using another OCT, you see. Are there any other questions from the floor or the other panelists? Uh, that's a great, that's a, hi, Sam. That's a great case. I mean, that's a, I think the most number of techniques and complications I've heard in six minutes, I think, are very well handled. And uh, I think a couple of questions. Did you reverse the heparin? Did you say you said the ACT was 170 at one point? Did you reverse the heparin? Uh, no, we didn't reverse heparin because we were concerned that we, st we thought that we could still manage this percutaneously. So what we did was we actually aimed for a much lower ACT. Right. Uh, the first, the ACT of 170 seconds, we checked it, it was 220. This was about 30 minutes prior to that. We wanted to keep a slightly lower one to ensure that we had a bailout therapy in case if we can stent, uh, but we didn't want to be giving uh, a protonin, and which potentially can cause another complication. Uh, which we That's absolutely correct, yes. I think it's a practice not reverse happen anymore because skin thrombosis could be worse than that. Um, you, uh, one of the best things you did in the procedure was uh, de uh, deliver the covered stent in the ostium of the circumflex, just covering the left main. And that's extremely tricky. I'm, and it's one of the hairiest kept probably because you've got the left main and of course the ramus. Uh, what tips did you use to position it right? Did you, is that, what, what were you looking at? How did you get the position right? Just to cover the perforation without occluding the LED? Uh, I, I tell you what, that was probably the most hair, uh, the, the most scary part of the whole case, actually. Um, so um, what uh, what we had to do, if you notice, there was actually quite a significant angulation to the circumflex. We actually had to partially disengage the EBU guide and anti-clock it is to, to in, in get, get a bit more coaxiality. And surprisingly, it was a, it was a very long uh, covered stent. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a shorter covered stent, uh, but our thought was any covered stent was a good covered stent. Uh, it was quite tricky, uh, but the, the most important thing for us was to make sure that the, uh, the proximal edge definitely covered at least the ramus, and that was what we wanted. Uh, and we were quite fortunate to also, when we inflated, and this was one of our learning points as well, is that with osteo lesions, uh, especially when we want to land it perfectly fine, sometimes it's best to just inflate it very slowly to make sure there's no translational movement of the balloon. And we did that very gradually and kept making sure that it was exactly where we wanted, because if that step went into the left main, it will be more, much more interesting uh, complication story uh, case. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, you're conscious that a covered stent can often foreshorten as inflated. And where you start may not be where you finally finish at the end of dilatation. So very yeah. well. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajakopa. Um, you, you mentioned about the dual antiplatelet for just one year. Is that enough when you have a, a covered stent on board? Oh, that's an excellent point. I think I don't. I don't think we entirely know. Um, the the only reason we suggested for a minimum of one year uh, was partly because uh, obviously we knew that that was probably the the most safest option. Uh, our our recommendations have always been uh, in our reports at twelve months to reassess their bleeding risk. Uh, because again, this is an elderly gentleman as well in his late 70s um, who has a, a few risk factors. And I think it hopefully will be fine for us to go for the more prolonged uh, anti ther um, antiplatelet therapy. But the reassuring thing was we actually did IVUS to confirm that there was good stent expansion, yeah. good no edge complication. And I think that possibly was one of probably one of the reasons why stent, these stents actually fail in the past. We potentially may not be imaging them, but as you would imagine, when you need a covered stent, it's when it's very severe and you're not really thinking that, well, we just want to solve the problem. But I think maybe getting to come back to reassess um, the stent may be useful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hasro. Maybe you can do another OCT in a year's time on the covered stent. See where it is. It's <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. An excellent case. We're going to move on because we're uh, short of time. Uh, the second case will be presented by Dr. Swanling. Uh, Dr. Swan uh, uh, Ling Seng from uh, Qing Mai Hospital from Taiwan. He's going to talk to us about another case of OCT related uh, uh, case. The OCT demonstrated extension catheter related stent deformation. Uh, Dr. Seng, please. Hello, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Swan Ling Seng from Qing Mai Hospital in Taiwan. Today, I will in share with you a case of stent deformation. This is a 53 years, years old man with history of non-ST elevation, MI, triple vessel disease, and uh, had received standing of left circumference and the right coronary artery in 2016. Recently, he had suffered intermittent chest pain with radiation to left arm for two months. The exercise stress test showed positive for ischemia. 
He then received coronary angiography, which reviewed stenosis of a PDA branch of RCA. There was no instant stenosis at previous stand of less second place, but we can see stenosis of proximal to distal segment of LAD. So we would like to deal with LAD lesion firstly. Initially, under the snapbox approach and the EBU guiding, we use OCT to check the lesion before balloon dilatation. We put back the OCT catheter from distal to proximal LAD and evaluate the vessel size and the landing zone. We calculate the proximal and the distal vessel size by EEM to EEM method. The length of a lesion is about 48 millimeter. We use 3O semi compliant balloon for dilatation. We use, and then we deploy a 3O drug eluting stand. After deploying the stand, we use semi compliant balloon for further dilatation. However, there was distal edge geography miss and the difficulty de delivering the balloon. So we tried six French Godzilla extension catheter and used balloon for anchoring. However, it's still difficult to deliver balloon in a step. Therefore, we use OCT to check the condition of the stand. There was no edge, distal edge dissection. The minimal stand area was 5.27 millimeter square. However, there was stand deformation at proximal segment. We use software to reconstruct the image and we can see the stand was compressed and distorted at the proximal segment. We also use 3D method to check the stand deformation. Therefore, we must deal with the plasma stand deformation carefully. So we use another smaller 5.5 French Galander extension catheter and the NC baron for anchoring. We dilated the deformed stand with 4.5 NC balloon. Then we deployed a new drug eluting stand over the deformed segment. We use NC balloon for post dilatation and the angiography result looks good. We use OCT to check outcome and there was no male opposition and no edge di dissection at proximal segment. We use 3D maser to check the stand and we can see pre the previous deformation was well covered by the new stand. Finally, the minimal stand area was 5.27 millimeter and the expansion rate was 82%. Most importantly, there were no edge dissection and no mouth opposition. So in this case, what is the mechanism for stand deformation and which choice of intracranial image is suitable for stand deformation? Finally, how to deal with stand deformation? Longitudinal stand deformation may be caused by the passage of post dilatation balloon or guide catheter extension. Stand deformation may be under recognized by fluoroscopy, whereas male upper deformed stand could be well defined and managed with OCT image. The treatment of stand Deformation includes dilatation of deformed segment with appropriate size balloon, and if required, another stem for optimal results. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I want to share with you today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sun. A uh, very interesting case as well. And uh, can I invite uh, another panelist? Perhaps this time, can I invite Dr. Masaki Tanabe uh, to comment on this case, please? Uh, you do a lot of OCT in Japan. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thank you for nice presentation. Mm. Uh, the deal of the, after deformation, uh, you 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 direct a more bigger non non complete value. After that, you check again in using OCT before additional thinking. Yeah, we 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 state the stand deformation by angiography first. So, uh, I I think maybe use OCT to check clearly the stand deformation may be appropriate. So we, then we use OCT to check the lesion. And then we see the compressed and the distorted stand deformation. So we use another bigger NC balloon to dilate the deformation. Yeah. If, if you very successfully dilated, uh, the the uh, healing the stent deformation, no more additional stenting, I think. Okay. Uh, just, just use barrel to. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. But, it's, but, but in my opinion, I I have less experience of stent deformation, so for me, it's appropriate for an, another new stent for yeah. deploy over the. Deformated stem, yeah. Uh, Doctor Sun, what was the reason for you to use the guide extension Godzilla again? Your balloon could not cross to the distal. Yeah, yeah. The uh, new, but uh, the in second try trying, I try. I use the NC track for a uh, for and uh, a smaller guide extension catheter to mm -hmm. pass the to try to pass the stem deformation. So I think this uh, most safe for this case. Yes. I see. Okay. Uh, that, I totally agree with Dr. Tanabe's comment because yeah. uh, usually when you do the, some kind of uh, a longitudinal deformity, we can collect with a large uh, non-compatible balloon or size matched uh, adequate balloon inflation. But in, in Dr. Chung's case, I think uh, initially, uh, proximal part of stent was malopposed. Yeah. In yeah. that situation, when we just push uh, without uh, any other just the proximal optimization, just pushing the NC balloon uh, in malopposed stent will make a very ugly deformity. Yeah. In those cases, sometimes, especially you do the second uh, daughter catheter, so definitely it will uh, deform hardly. So we can, in those cases, it is very hard to recollection by just the NC balloon. So in those cases, sometimes we need additional stenting. So maybe Dr. Chang is, don't have another option. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, last comment, we have, don't have much time. I was also myself wondering whether I would just put a short stent to treat that mid LAD lesion enough. I would not touch the uh, distal LAD. I actually thought your stent was too long, you see, in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, we move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Sang. Um, the third uh, presenter is going to be Dr. Mohammed Andy Yassin from Glen Eagles in uh, Indonesia. He's going to present to us on a case of intravascular lithotripsy to aid calcified left main stem bifurcation stenting in a patient with severe left ventricular impairment. Dr. Mohammed, please. Thank you for the kind introductions. Good evening, uh, I'm Andy. I'm an interventional fellow from Indonesia, currently training in Glen Eagles GPMC Brunei. I would like to present my case with the title Intravascular Lithotripsy in High Risk Left Main PCI with my supervisor, Dr. Rajinikan Rajagopal from Glen Eagles GPMC Brunei. And this is the hospital, a very nice beachside hospital. I have nothing to disclose. As the case, a 62 years old female was referred from neuro, recent cardioembolic stroke with severe LV dysfunction on echo exam. 
she had a 31% ejection fraction with global, global LV hypokinesia. ECG showed sinusism with left ventricular hypertrophy and inverted T wave in lateral leads. Her NGO showed a left main and triple vessel disease, not a good candidate for cabbage in view of recent CVA. He had a PCI to RCA previously in May 2021, and this is a stage PCI left main bifurcation, and patient had hypertension and dyslipidemia. As so the plan was six French right radial R3 using Terumo glycid slender, a seven French EBU 3.5 guide. We also put in five French right femoral R3 for IBP access if required, and five French right femoral vein. The reason why we didn't put the IBP beforehand is because it's a stable patient and we already treated the RCA for backup, but we got access just in case. And attempt cutting balloon, and if it's not if it's not fully expanded, we'll do rotablation or IVL, and decay cross standing for the life man bifurcation. So here's the diagnostic. We could see severe calcification from the left main, extending to both the LAD and the circumflex, with moderate to severe stenosis in the ostial LAD and severe stenosis in the ostial of the circumflex. So a Medina of 111. Here's an OCT run for the LAD with co-registration. And here's an overview of the OCT. It's a diffusely diseased vessel from left main to distal LAD with deep and superficial calcium. Uh, 270 degrees calcification near diagonal branch and also 90 to 180 degrees calcification in the left main. We measured the length was around 55 millimeter with the distal LED was 2 millimeter in diameter and 3.3 millimeter in the osseal left main. So for the preparation, we prepared, we prepared the circumflex with a 2O by 15 millimeter NC balloon up to 20 atmosphere. But Unfortunately, we couldn't pass the 2.5 millimeter warfarin cutting balloon. So we tried to further dilate using a 2.5 millimeter NC balloon up to 18 atmosphere. But as you can see, the balloon wasn't fully expanded. So we decided to use IVL. Several IVL treatment in the osseal circumflex was done. And finally, the balloon could expand nicely in the fifth treatment. That's it. That is after a total of 50 pulses. And the 2.5 millimeter Wolverine cutting balloon was passed successfully and fully expanded. Yes, the NGO recoil was seen, but from previous ballooning, we achieved good expansion. And then we continued preparing the LAD using the same 2.5 IVL balloon, we treated the osseal and the proximal LAD. And further dilatation using 2.5 millimeter NC, starting distally to osseal LAD up to 16 atmosphere. And here is the LAD after preparation, look much better. And we proceed to the decay crush. First, a 2.75 by 12 millimeter science stand was deployed in the side branch, the circumflex, then crushed using a 3 ONC balloon. Circumflex was recrossed, and we did the first kissing balloon using 2 3 ONC balloon. Proceed to stenting the main vessel, the mid distal LED using 225 by 23, and overlap to osseal left main with a 3 by 33 stand. And then did the first pot using a 3.75 NC balloon, recrossed the circumflex again, and did the second kissing balloon using a 3 O NC and a 2.75 NC in the circumflex. Then again, a second pot using a 3.75 NC. Here's the NGO after second pot. Some irregular appearance in the circumflex ostium, and we couldn't uh, pass the OCT catheter. So third kissing balloon was done using two 3 O N C balloon. 
And here it is, uh, an excellent final result. And here's a side by side before and after, like looking like night and day. As a discussion points, throughout the procedure, the patient was stable, no hemodynamic support was used. With OCT, we could clearly see the calcium and that gives us better planning, either rota or IVL was needed. Treatment of calcium using combination of cutting balloon and lithotripsy in this patient resulting excellent lesion preparation and final result. Rotablation would have been a high risk for this patient, left main disease with severe LV dysfunction, but we managed to avoid that because of successful lithotripsy. And decay crush was considered as the optimal standing strategy for this patient, a Medina 111 and complex left main bifurcation. So as a take home message, in this patient with severe LV impairment and complex left main bifurcation, IVL along with cutting balloon met a complex procedure less complex. And IVL in the left main was well tolerated with no hemodynamic compromise during balloon inflations. And it is important to observe sufficient intervals between inflations and monitor the pressure carefully. That is all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Not a very challenging case. Uh, can I just ask you uh, whether you did any uh, assessment for ischemic burden or in, of the anterior wall or posterior wall uh, viability? Yeah, uh, we did not do any uh, physiology or ischemic testing for that for those. Uh, basically, the patient complained of uh, SOB on exertion with no chest pain. And from her from her echo, it was shown that she was uh, she had a thirty one percent ejection fraction. So we did the angio and further uh, do the PCI. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I just invite another panelist uh, in to see if there are any questions? Okay, in that case, can I invite Dr. Ivanson, please? Yes, uh, congratulations on your case. The patient's uh, outcome is very good. Uh, may I ask, did the patient get any drop in blood pressure during the procedure? Because during uh, IVL, usually the, uh, the balloon need to be inflated for quite a uh, long period of time. Did the patient have any drop in blood pressure? Yeah, excellent point. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the scariest part about IVL or any ballooning in the left main especially. But in this case, uh, when we do the IVL, we, we give enough time to, to let the vessel breathe in. And the ballooning itself is like for 10 pulses. So that's around eight to 10 seconds. And uh, between those pulses, between those treatment, we give enough uh, time to let the myocard uh, breathe. So during the whole procedure, the patient uh, was very stable. The blood pressure was never dropped, no inotropes were given. So uh, yeah, hope that answered your question. Sometimes it's quite difficult to predict the, out the, the, the outcome of the patient. I have experienced before that uh, uh, the patient with ejection fraction similar 30%, but when I do the ballooning to the left main, then the patient developed PA arrest. So it's quite difficult. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still also very difficult to determine whether we need to put in, say, IBP or even impaler beforehand. Yeah, excellent point. Actually, uh, when, we did the, when we did this, we, we did the RCA beforehand. We did the RCA beforehand, and maybe that gives us some uh, good backup in case when we are ballooning the left main and the LAD and everything, when we do the IVL, maybe the RCA flow gives some good backup to the left coronary system. Maybe that's, that's what helps us. If you were faced with a case like this, Dr. Sung, would you have done it using rotablator in Hong Kong? I think it depends on the imaging. If uh, we usually we are in our experience, if the calcium is uh, concentrated, we still proceed to uh, IVL. But if for those uh, uh, eccentric or some uh, like calcium low deal, sometimes we may use uh, orbital. And it depends. Also depends on the Y bias to see whether rotation is good or not. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Can I now pass on the uh, floor to Dr. Professor Nan now, my co-chairperson, 
uh, to okay so i am chang nam from gaming university in korea so i will uh, introduce paul's presenter dr rohit modi from india his title is the shockwave risotripsy in ibs guided pci of car spike vessel dr modi please good day everybody uh, today i am presenting uh, the, uh, the case of shockwave uh, lithotripsy in which we used IVL, uh, which was IVS guided PCI of the calcified vessels. Um, especially, we did uh, the, the patients who had large, large caliber vessels and eccentric calcium. There are no conflicts of interest. Calcium is not just about its presence. It can be deep by imaging. It can be, we can see it clearly. It can be deep. It can be superficial. It can be nodular. If you take the time to do the imaging pre-PCI, take the time to do imaging before stent deployment also. You can look for the dissections. You can look for the fissures. You can look for the fractures. And the important is the extent of calcium. If there is a superficial calcium, you must know what is the angle, what is the thickness, what is the length. And when we use intravascular lithotripsy device, uh, shock wave, uh, uh, this is, uh, is used. It uses three meters long, the 12 millimeter semi compliant balloon that converts electrical energy into transient acoustic pressure pulses, maximum 80 pulses. So the patient details, 75 years old male, hypertensive, diabetic, angina on exertion, angiography reveals double vessel disease. There was a diseased LED which was not so calcified and then there was an RCA with severe calcification. The stent was deployed in uh, mid-LED. You can see a very good, nice result in the LED. Then the wire was crossed. BMW was crossed in the RCA. You can see uh, very calcified and RCA, tight RCA. And you can see the balloon was, pre dilatation was done with 2.75 to 10 millimeter balloon at 18 atmospheres. You can see a drop, drop boning there. Then the IVS was crossed after the uh, pre dilatation with NC balloon. And you can see a cell of concentric calcium uh, there. Then the shock with lithotripsy was done. Uh, it was done from distally to proximally with 315 millimeter balloon. At uh, we went first with a four millimeter balloon and then dilated to eight millimeter. And 40 pulses were given on each side from distal to proximal. And then a 3.5 into 28 millimeter stent was deployed in mid LED, mid RCA at 16 atmosphere. Another Tests 4 into 32 millimeter was deployed in the austral, uh, austral RCA. You can see this is a stent being deployed, good expansion. And the post dilatation was done with a 4 into 28 millimeter balloon at 80 atmosphere. And you can see the final result. It well, uh, well expanded a good MLA as compared to the distal vessel. It is a good MLA and good expansion. And this is the final angiographic result. Another case, a 65 years old male, a diabetic patient, known case of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, angina on exertion. The patient's vitals were stable. Actually, the patient is a post CABG patient and Lima 2 LED is patent. It is a protective LED. But the patient has a left main to LCX disease. Uh, and the patient was symptomatic, breathless also, along with angina. So the, uh, the lien in the LCX was crossed with a BMW wire. It was pre-dilated, uh, pre-dilated the lien with 2.5 millimeter balloon at 18 atmosphere. You can so see it has expanded, but it is not expanded to its full expansion of 2.5 millimeter. We did a pre-PCI hours. There was an eccentric calcium ring. Uh, and it was a large vessel also. 
Uh, you can see it is a very large vessel of, uh, of the order of 4.5 millimeter. And lithotripsy in the left main coronary artery to LCX with 3 into 15 millimeter balloon at 30 pulses each side was given. Uh, you can see the post lithotripsy IVAS, you can see there is a fracturing of the calcium there. Yeah? 3.5 into 32 deaths deployed in left main coronary artery to LCX at 16 atmosphere. Then uh, you can see now the 3.5 millimeter, how uh, fully it has expanded now. And the post dilatation with 4.5 millimeter balloon into 10 millimeter balloon was done. And you can see the result after the post dilatation. And this is the final fully expanded stent from the left wing to the LCX uh, with, the, with the help of the high wheel. So to conclude, here we present our initial experience with shock wing IVL system. We assume it an innovative technology where the calcified lesions, which were not amenable with other methods were treated and there appears to be a lesser complication rate like perforation or no reflow. In literature, SIVL is found to be useful when the calcium is superficial and superficial as well as beam. Its efficacy in large vessel diameter and eccentric calcium is questionable. In our case, we found it to be useful for large diameters, deep calcium, and eccentric lesions, as characterized by IVAS imaging. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Modi. Uh, it's a very excellent case. So actually, in Korea, it's not available in uh, about the IVR. So it is quite interesting to see that those are our very hard case. So this case is open to discussion. Is there any question or comment? How about Dr. Danabe? So do you have any experience like this case? Uh, sorry, uh, in Japan also, uh, we, we are not uh, available. So, All right. maybe, so maybe in this similar case, we use rotavator. Yes. Uh, big, bigger, bigger, uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Actually, one thing I want to make a comment here that uh, in literature, what I've found is that IVL, uh, IVL is useful in the calcified lesions. Uh, the ray artery and the, to, uh, to, to, it, to, to be very effective, the artery to balloon ratio should be one is to one. That because uh, that is a mechanism that the uh, the shock waves are transmitted in a way and the balloon should touch the vessel wall, only then the energy can be transmitted to the calcium. But here we found that uh, uh, the vessel size was about 4, 4.5, uh, like that. And uh, we don't have available balloon diameter more than 3 millimeter. Three, uh, I think one was 3.5 millimeter and 3 millimeter. So still uh, the IVL worked, we could uh, uh, break the top boning of the RCA DN. And also we could uh, see uh, in a very large left main, you could you could see uh, we post dilated the, the 4.5 millimeter at uh, about 18, 20 atmosphere, uh, giving it a size of about five millimeter. So even these large vessels, uh, this was found to be effective. And uh, even uh, they say that eccentric lesions, they are not, uh, like very favorable for IVL, but we found them useful in our cases. That was the point of like discussion. I could uh, just add on uh, to those points. Yes, um, I think you're right, Dr. Modi, as Dr. Modi said, you, you need to go for a one-to-one -one, uh, sizing with the IVL. Uh, and one of the advantages of that is you save the number of balloons. You don't need to keep up sizing balloons. And IVL has got a very good crossing profile. It can cross most lesions. If they don't, you just need a two or balloon, and then usually you can get even the biggest IVL in. And then it once you deliver the pulses, if it expands, it's straight away get one-to-one -one dilatation. You don't need any more NC or cutting balloons. You can get your scan 10. Uh, so it can, in a way, you know, it's very expensive balloon, but it can save a couple of NC or cutting balloons. Uh, the thing about eccentric has we, we do IVL quite regularly in our hospital. Uh, including a handful of left mains, uh, big vessels. So the thing about 
uh, eccentric calcium as it is correct. The literature is right that it doesn't work as well, especially in nodular calcium. I think that's yeah. one situation where we found uh, IVL to be not very effective. Uh, the one tip they do offer with uh, eccentric calcium is to use more pulses. Where with concentric calcium, just 20 or 30 pulses can do the job. If it's eccentric yeah. calcium, there are times we have delivered all 80 pulses in the same location to get adequate fracture and expansion. So that is something worth trying in eccentric uh, calcified cases. Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, in uh, when we find an eccentric calcified nodule, uh, it, it, it becomes uh, also difficult when we use rota also because sometimes there is a wire bias. Absolutely. We we cannot uh, like uh, produce the desired effect with rota also. Yeah. So, but uh, here uh, I, I have presented this one case, but we have done uh, more cases also where we have triated calcified nodule and uh, found it uh, quite useful. Okay, right. yeah. Actually, uh, eccentric calcium is always very tough case. So we can <laughs> overcome sometimes. Okay, yes. because of time limitation, it will be better to move to the next case. This case will be presented by Tanawer Suesa from Thailand. His presentation title is High Risk PCI of Left Main Bifurcation with the CTO OCR Circumplex. Dr. Suesa, please. Thank you for your kind introductions. Good afternoon, moderators panelists and our presenters. My name is Thanawat Sat from Konkan Hospital, Thailand. I have no disclosure. My case was 87 year old uh, woman as a nurse mother, presented with chest pain and dyspnea for one day. Blood pressure 100 over 60. Uh, she has frequent readmission four times in six months. She has ESRD with regular hemodialysis, COPD, diabetes, and hypertension. The latter cardiomyopathy was diagnosed six months ago with medical treatment at Hartford Clinic and refused to angioclams previously. EKT show a normal central system for application, general ST depletion. Echo show LV dilatation, global LV hypokinesia, and rejection fraction 22%, my MR, AR, and TR. Lab show anemia, high slum creatinine, elevated correct troponin, and low VNT levels. Medical treatment initially as non stimmy ACS with quantitative heart failure. This is her medication include antipellet, army, beta blocker, and statin. In this admission, patients were advised to angioplam after congestion and heart failure improved. Left for system show heavy calcification from left main to LAD, severe distal left main stenosis with uh, bifurcation Medina 111, and stenosis as proximal uh, LAD involved big decanal blanch with total occlusion osseo circumflex with, uh, with minimal bridging collateral. For RCA, just uh, minimal disease, no collateral to left side. In conclusion, patient has double vessel disease with left main bifurcation with CTO or CO6 with unclear stump and heavy calcification, blood pressure 100 over 60, LVD pre 30 millimeter mercury. Uh, light heart cardboard performed for elevated pulmonary hypertension and get it for uh, heart failure treatment. We calculated syntax score was 54, which prefer cabbage over PCI. However, SAS score also very really highly is more the around 50%. We discussion with her team and patients and her daughters, surgical turned out by surgery surgeons, and because very highly complex PCI, so patients refuse to uh, cabbage and refuse to PCI and continue medical treatment. However, five days later, Patient and her daughter changed decision to PCI with acceptable high risk procedure. So correct MRI was performed for checks, YBD test, especially for second phase uh, area and show viable or mercury segment. For my plans, I have three key points consideration. First, I plan PCI to left main LED, and I will try to open second phase because viable show in this area. But if uh, difficult, or I fail to open circle fake, I will sacrifice it and just stand left main to LED. Second, second point is heavy calcification from angiogram may be need arterectomy, cutting balloon, or scoring balloon. 
And the last point, I think about hemodynamic support for complex anatomy with pro LV function in critical heart failure, but only IBP available in my cat lab. For hemodynamic support, I use protect PCI algorithm. If score more than four, consider hemodynamic support. In this patient score seven. I calculated cardiac power output CPO with direct correlate with in organ perfusion. In this patient CPO, uh, 0 0.64. If uh, CPO more than 0 0.6, you can use IBP instead of Impella, tandem path or uh, more hemorrhagic support. Before PCI, patient had a bradycardia and hyperkalemia, so time replace maker was inserted for heart backup and correct hyper-K. I insert IBP we are left row artery before PCI, and I use seven frames if you uh, size hole. I use young Y and LED to LED and diagonal blanch. I started with small balloon P dilatation before I was for green imaging. I was show calcification along left main to um, mid LED. You can see superficial calcification at proximal to mid LED more than 270 degrees at length more than five millimeters. So I decided to use arterectomy in this case. I can see uh, osteo of circumflex because very hard to identify because calcification. So prime modification with 1.5 bottle tablator followed by NSE scalding balloon 3O. The left main looks better. Uh, there are some dissection here at the mid LED. I tried to open circumflex in the epicoral view, but I failed at the first attempt with pilot 50 and 5 clots. So I changed to pilot 200 uh, with double lumen metal catheter for more support for success to clot CTO. And finally, I uh, checked the tolerance off with inject contrast via metal catheter, then secretial dilatation with HC and NC balloon. After the dilatation, search, uh, I was could not pass to search because very angulation and calcification. So I plan to rotabrator for search. Unfortunately, uh, patient had developed bifnia and heart failure. So I start intubation and I need to finish my job very quickly at this time. I decide to stand with LED first uh, with a uh, stand trio by 18 overlap position with a uh, 3.5 by 24 stand at uh, LV to left main. And I try to place position for a circ stand, very difficult. So I use Gaisila, Gai extension to assist and deploy circ stand, uh, preparing for a mini clutch technique. The clutch, I clutch uh, left main LED stand and revise, and then kissing with NC balloon. And then part with a uh, four or NC balloon. I check I was up the standing is true good expansion and a position with active effective center area from blue over 5678. After PCI's patients uh, of AVP and of neutral two decrease probability level and discharge three day after PCI's. She followed up at half a clinic without the admission again for six months. Every each infection improved. She actually improved after PCI. In conclusion, patient with uh, not surgical candidate precise treatment is a uh, with multivessel disease with LV dysfunction with heart failure is reasonable, safe and effective with mechanical support. And IBP still pay a low for our prophylactic issue with support. However, it's too narrow window of opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Suesat. Uh, it's a very excellent case, very uh, also very tough case. So it will often to discussion. Because of time limitation, it will be better to only one or two comments or uh, question. So is there any- I, I would other like to comment and say that in this case, I think the most important test you've done was the viability of the muscles. Mm -hmm. And therefore, after you successfully revascularized the patient, the ejection fraction improved. I'm sure this patient will be very thankful to you. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's your strategy is very good because uh, in, in uh, this kind of tough case with a uh, severe LV dysfunction, saving of left main to LAD is first target. So if you cannot often circumflex, you can sac sacrifice circumflex, it's already CTO. So saving the LAD territory is most important. And fortunately, you often circumflex. Uh, yes. It's a very excellent case. Uh, initially, I, I think I maybe I cannot to open circumflex because 
uh, CTO is uh, really difficult with poor IV function and clinical assessing of patient is not good at, at the first time. But from MRI, uh, the test is show viable. So I will try <laughs> to open uh, because it, it's better to open the circumflex to completely vascularization for this patient. Okay, is there any other comments? So let's move to the last case. The uh, last case will be presented by Dr. Haryum Tiaki uh, from India. Uh, his uh, presentation title is uh, Tychogravular Associated High Degree Hot Blood, a case report and the review of the literature. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important platform to present myself uh, the one of the complex cases. Uh, the, my presentation is a high degree uh, triventricular block in uh, post PCI case in the young patient. So I am Dr. Hariyam Tyagi, uh, DM Cardiology from uh, Meret Lokpriya Hospital, India. So. Thank you very much, and uh, it's my disclosure. So the my case uh, summary is like that. Uh, it's a 45-year-old diabetic male presented to us with uh, complaint of uh, chest pain and sweating and uh, suffocation for last three hours, and associated with generalized weakness for last one day prior to admission. His ECG shows uh, ST elevation in infralateral leads, and echocardiogram shows infraposterior territory hypokinetic with mild LV systolic dysfunction, ejection fraction of around 40 to 45% with mild mitral regurgitation. Uh, coronary angiogram uh, shows triple vessel disease with uh, LCX uh, proximal 100% culprit vessel. So uh, this was uh, is ECG at the time of presentation. It shows the 2-3 AVF and V5, V6 ST elevation with reciprocal changes. Patient was in normal sinus rhythm. Vitals was okay at that time. So angiogram was done uh, at that time. So it right coronary artery, codominant circulation, proximal shows more than 90% uh, lesion with mid around 70% uh, uh, lesion. PDPLV looks uh, okay. PDPLV shows some uh, 40 to 50 percent disease in proximal part, and this was left coronary system. It uh, left main is more or less normal, but LCX is angulated and proximal uh, 100 percent. And high OM shows uh, osteal 90 percent small vessel disease, yeah. and uh, ramus is significantly large vessel shows uh, uh, proximal around uh, 90 percent disease. LED shows osteoproximal lesion and up to the mid portion, it shows around 60 to 70% borderline lesion. Type three vessel diagonal swirl looks okay. So our plan is to uh, do the culprit vessel LCX uh, first. And this was um, uh, done uh, through the radial route and uh, this ABO and LCX was crossed with the Sion blue regular wire after that, uh, thrombosection was done, and this was the stent in proximal part, landing into this uh, uh, healthy zone just after the LCX into the LCX to the proximal LCX to the OM. So after putting the stent in the proximal LCX to OM, so this was the scenario. It shows the some uh, disease. Uh, residual left into the uh, major obtuse also. So we have taken another stent, uh, resolutonics, and from uh, overlapping, and it's uh, 24 millimeter, 2.5 into 24 millimeter into the OM, overlapping stent, and into the LCX, it is 2.75 into uh, 18 millimeter stent resolutonics. So, after putting the stent, post dilatation was done, and this was the scenario after uh, this uh, procedure. Good timetry flow, patient was okay, pain free. So it was uh, patient was shifting to the emergency room and uh, discharged on third day. But uh, patient was readmitted uh, uh, around 40 days uh, later 
in the hospital with a complaint of uh, dyspnea, suffocation, and uh, weakness for last 24 to 48 hours prior to the admission. ECG shows recent inferior wall MI, the, the old uh, recent changes, and echocardiograms was uh, same territory. Uh, uh, inferior territory shows 40 to 45 percent ejection fraction with mild mitral regurgitation. But uh, in the view, the patient uh, continuing this uh, exertional symptoms and dyspnea and chest pain after uh, doing that LCX also. So that residual lesion, this was the ECG at the time, second time presentation. It was so, so no normal sinus rhythm with the T wave inversion into the inferior legs. And uh, uh, Rehospitalization course in the view of the persistent angina and remaining vessel PCI performed PTCA to ramus and uh, right coronary artery to be planned because it was triple vessel disease at the time of acute event uh, 40 days back. Culprit vessel was LCX that was 100% and done with the two stents and later on the stage PCI with the ramus and uh, right coronary artery in this setting. It was done uh, using the 2.7522 millimeter resolutonics into the ramus and uh, 3.5 to 38 millimeter promus into the uh, right coronary artery. So this was the right coronary artery. Previously, it showed that 90% proximal and around 70 to 80% in the mid portion. So it was done with this uh, 38 millimeter promus stent and post dilatation was done. The good timi 3 flow, there is no residual uh, slow flow. And after that, this ramus critical lesion uh, with the significant large vessel more than 2.75. So this uh, <clears throat> ramus was done with the 2.75 to 22 millimeter resolutonics. And after the post dilatation, this was the result. So now all three culprit uh, vessels and critical lesions, previously the LCX and now in this setting, the ramus and right coronary artery was done uh, at uh, Post procedure uh, that was uh, okay. Now patient was shifted to uh, coronary care unit, and patient was okay. But in the morning, during hospitalization, within after 24 hours in the morning, patient uh, developed a syncopal attack, and ECG shows uh, some AV nodal block. So during taking his uh, breakfast in the morning in the bed, he developed a syncopal attack, and for few seconds he was faint. So, and ECG shows uh, there is no QRS, only the P waves are there in the ECG. So, that suggests there is some uh, thing is uh, there into this uh, coronary circulation or patient uh, have some other uh, problem with the IV block. So, first I have to look uh, that uh, uh, coronary system, right coronary and left coronary LCX that I have done recently. So we have the take patient after that uh, shifted to the cath lab into from this coronary care unit and temporary pacemaker was put in this one and the check shot for the angiogram for the right coronary and the LCX was done. So that shows that the left uh, LCX and right coronary was flowing good. There is no significant uh, any the significant flow diminution or the side branch pinching into the LCX, OM, and uh, RCA. So the region to be ruled out and patient after the temporary pacing is shifted again to the coronary care unit. So after the uh, 48 hours, patient, uh, initially it was on temporary, in between paroxysmal uh, AV blocks were there, but after uh, a uh, few uh, 48 hours, patient was totally dependent on the temporary pacemaker. So after uh, rule out other possibilities of metabolic causes, some electrolyte, sodium, potassium, renal profile, atropine was given, the vagolysis was done to that patient. So uh, that was no, uh, shows no changes in the rhythm observed after 48 hours. And uh, then we stopped that uh, Tika grillor and shifted on uh, prasugril uh, and wait for 24 to 40 hour, uh, hours. Patient was fully dependent on TPI, so we plan for the permanent pacemaker in this patient. So uh, after uh, putting this, uh, this was, uh, so in this uh, patient, uh, 
for the permanent pacemaker three uh, uh, already he has uh, uh, four stents were there 40 days back uh, that was culprit uh, vessel two stents lcx and om were done and uh, this setting two stent in ramus and rc was done so already on the four stent long stents patients need permanent pacemaker so uh, we have uh, the planning for the permanent pacemaker but the patient don't want to take any risk and uh, we explained uh, any consequences of this uh, uh, taking the uh, permanent pacemaker the routine permanent pacemaker device but uh, after taking some uh, other consultation from two three doctors the patient asked to me to put this micro device leadless pacemaker so that he can avoid these unnecessary consequences of uh, pocket hematoma or infection or uh, any thrombotic uh, uh, consequences if we shut down or uh, if we uh, decrease the antiplatelet therapy so after uh, taking the consent of the patient and patient attendant we have planned this uh, leadless pacemaker uh, micro device and uh, this device was uh, put in the right ventricular cavity so after putting this micro device patient was uh, salubriously discharged from the hospital with a therapy of uh, aspirin uh, prasugril uh, rosuvastatin along with supportive treatment and this was the ecg after the putting the pacemaker uh, discussion is that that the tricaglor uh, uh, i don't know the what is the culprit uh, part in this patient to give this uh, paroxysmal uh, transient av block initially and later on permanent av block but uh, regarding the tricaglor there is some study some trials or some cases case reports were there it's uh, cyclopenta triazolipyrimidine the plasma half life of 6 to 12 hours uh, so this P2Y12 inhibitor uh, shows uh, recently several reports regarding the ticagrelor may be associated with uh, some conduction abnormalities. After a detailed search, only the nine cases on the topic of ticagrelor related conduction abnormalities reported till date. The mean age of the patient in all these studies around 57.5 years and gender is 100% male. So all patients developed various degree of AV blocks and sinus arrest or ventricular pauses, except for one case who developed atrial fibrillation of nine patients, six had pre-existing AV conduction disorder and eight were on AV blocking agents. So we present uh, uh, this, our case uh, with the symptomatic AV nodal dysfunction in a patient treated with ticaglor post-PCI for inferior wall MI. The exact mechanism for ticaglor induced bradyarrhythmia is unclear although the inhibition of adenosine reuptake is proposed as likely in this patient in our case due to the intermittent nodal block for two days, thereafter fully dependent on TPI so that TPI cannot be removed and also cannot be stopped antiplatelet in this case. So we plan for permanent pacemaker, micro DDS pacemaker, uh, with the patients and uh, uh, attendants request. In nursal, the close monitoring with the ticaglor is required. It may re result in advanced conduction disorder. This is one of the rarest case which required permanent pacemaker with continuation of antiplatelet drugs. In 10 published uh, case reports associated with bradyarrhythmias, all cases occurred in patients with uh, ACS and seven out of 10 had pre-existing conduction disease on baseline ECG with concurrent beta blocker in most of the cases. Ticaglor was seized in all patients and substituted with other clopidogrel or prasugrel. Two patients with pre-morbid ECG conduction abnormality required permanent pacemaker insertion due to persistence of heart block despite of discontinuation of the ticaglor. So in our case, uh, symptomatic and profound block in a patient treated with ticaglor post-PCI for inferior MI. This was observed in our patient even in the absence of the baseline conduction disease or concurrent confounding medications. And like most cases in the published literature, highlights the need for the broader uh, awareness for ticaglor's not insignificant bradyarrhythmia potential. So these are some case studies that shows that uh, from different parts of the world, with the age group around 39 to 80 years, and uh, the onset of the bradyarrhythmias with the sing or syncopal attacks 
so either the sinus arrest or av blocks uh, or twist to one block or complete heart block it occurs after one hour of initiating of the ticagrelor and range up to the up to the two months after the post pci in our case it was done after the 40 days after it starting of the ticagrelor and all shows there is some uh, first degree block or second degree block or sinus arrest but only two cases required permanent pacemaker in these uh, all case reports but our uh, in our cases due to the persistence of the av block and uh, dependent totally on the temporary pacemaker we need for the permanent pacemaker uh, for support to the conduction abnormality thank you very much so thank you dr tayaki yeah, so it's an excellent case presentation and uh, because of time limitation, we don't have enough time to discuss your case. So uh, in this complex PCI a, a symposium, uh, this session is really challenging and complex case. So we all discuss uh, six cases of a uh, very tough chip, case, chip patient. And we see the mostly a uh, car spine and left main bifurcation. We saw the coronary perforation and the IVL cases. It was very excellent. So uh, it, it was a very fruitful discussion and then hope everybody enjoyed this session. Thank you very much for all presenters, attendees, and uh, all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.